All right. So in this video, I'm going to just briefly uh, introduce functional response models, which are one kind of nonlinear model that you find when dealing with consumption uh, in ecological models. So predator prey or herbivore uh, producer type models. The particular The particular system we're going to work with here, this is the predator. It's a flatworm called stenostomum. And so their average size are about half a millimeter long. This is the prey that they're eating. These are paramecium. And these guys are uh, much smaller. You can see there's 20 micrometers so um, on that slide there. So typically they're less than 100 micrometers in, in size. So about 20% the size of, of the predator. And then the other part of this experiment, which I won't talk about much in this um, particular oops, um, video, is they also sometimes include um, a non-prey uh, protist in there, which is this guy, Euplectes, or Euplodes, sorry. And when they add uh, ground up flatworms to a culture of Euplodes, these guys undergo a morphological change where they grow a lot bigger and then they become inedible by the um, stenostoma. Okay, so here's the data. This is uh, Pavel Kratina and call, um, his work from published in 2007 in the journal Ecology. And this is more or less figure one from their paper. I've added the raw data um, behind it. Uh, they were kind um, Pavel was kind enough to share the raw data with me. So basically the experiment consists of different densities of paramecium in 900 microliter um, wells, so you've got anywhere from 40 up to 200 paramecium in these little containers. And then they add, And then there were also uh, euplodes, which were too big to eat, so um, how many euplodes did they add? I'm trying to remember. Oops. I knew this. 60. So there were 60 euplodes in the ones that are triangles there. The circles are without euplodes. And they add 16 predators, and then they wait four hours, and then they then they suck everybody out and uh, count them. Actually, they they kill them by adding a drop of Lugol solution, and then they they count everybody who's left. Um, and so what you can see is the more prey there are, the more each of the predators eat. That's pretty um, seems pretty reasonable. Um, and uh, the presence of non-prey. Um, reduces the effectiveness of the uh, of the predator. They eat less prey, so they're, they're getting what's called interference. And so they did a bunch of things with with this sort of data. But just for today's demonstration, I'm just going to talk about. I keep clicking on the wrong thing. Today's demonstration, we're just going to fit one of these models. So typically, we've got two types of functional responses. Here's a type two functional response. So y is the number of prey consumed per predator. X is the number of um, prey. Ignore the C for a moment. The classical type 2 response is just this part here without the C. A is the attack rate, how fast per unit time the predators are attacking. Uh, and B, or 1 over B rather, B is the handling time. So 1 over B is the maximum rate at which predators can attack prey. C here is something that they tested in their model which basically says there's some minimum number of prey that they'll eat even when prey are very rare. It was one of the alternative models they tested. A um, couple of things about this. So what makes this non-linear? Well if you look at, if, forget about the C, if you look at this thing, you, X, the, the thing that we're interested in, right, is appearing both in the 
numerator of this fraction and in the denominator. And the covariates are multiplied by that thing. So AX by itself is fine as a linear thing. ABX is fine as a linear thing. But the combination of those two things as a ratio is completely nonlinear. And there's no way really to, if you took the logarithm of this thing, it would still be nonlinear. Okay. Um, it would be an, yeah, an ugly mess. That's a type 2 function. The type 3 is the same except that now it has the um, x squared. <clears throat> so the difference between these two is that this one just rises to an asymptote. This one accelerates initially and then flattens off to an asymptote. So I'll show you that in a second. So let's just pick one of those. We're going to use the type 3 model without the intercept, so we'll ignore the C for the moment. What that means is that when prey are 0, the assumption is that the um, consumption rate of the predator is also 0, which is a reasonable sort of assumption. We're going to use the simplest model for N, called NLS, it's part of the base R, um, stands for nonlinear least squares. And that reflects how it's going about estimating the parameters of this model. We specify a formula, just like we always have. So prey underscore consumed underscore four hours, that's our response variable. Tilde tells it, OK, so that what's on the left-hand side is the response. But what goes on the right-hand side is now quite a bit different. So whereas before, we might have just said prey density, and R would assume that was a linear model and that there was a multiplicative coefficient in front of it. Now we have a nonlinear function, and we actually literally type out the function uh, at, that we want. So a times prey density squared. I'll put that in brackets so that it makes sure that that gets calculated together. Divided by, and then again in brackets, 1 plus a times b times prey density squared. Okay, so we've just literally described the nonlinear function using R code and put that into the formula. Then you tell it where the data frame is, where the data are. And the additional piece here with nonlinear models, um, especially if you have uh, a sort of strange nonlinear model like this one, you also have to tell it where to start searching. So the, the underlying algorithm that's going to tell us what the best parameters are is going to is an iterative algorithm that basically looks at the derivative of the likelihood surface, chooses a direction to go, and then takes a step in that direction. Then it recalculates the likelihood, calculates the derivatives, and again changes again. And it keeps doing that until it finds the um, best solution is basically the point at which the derivative in the likelihood is zero. In other words, it finds a local minimum in the likelihood surface. But in order to start that, you have to give it values of A and B to start with. And they don't have to be precise, but they got to be in the right ballpark, right? They have to be kind of meaningful. And this is where I mean, it took me about 20 minutes of messing around to figure out what the what were good values here and doing some math to figure out, you know, just what the right interpretation was of, of all of these things. So B being the handling time, uh, that suggests, you know, this sort of number suggests that the asymptote of our function is uh, going to be at around 10 prey per four hours um, at very high numbers of prey. Uh, for a long time, I was trying a number that was too low. I was trying 1 over 5, okay, which doesn't seem like it would be very different, but it, it was just too low. Similarly, with the attack rate, I was trying values that were um, substantially too high, and I, I couldn't get it, even though it was 0.1 was the value that I was trying. That's actually much too high, and I couldn't I couldn't get a reasonable result. So this is this initializing these models, um, no matter which package you're using to fit them, is an important. Um, and difficult step. Okay, so we fit the model. Then um, I want to add a curve to my plot, and I do that exactly the same way as we've done for all nonlinear models. So there's my new data frame. Prey density is the only thing that's varying. 
and then I use the predict function with my fitted model and new data and that gives me um, I'm just going to put it in the ND data frame there's my um, Y value and then I get that plot there so here's what I mean by a type 3 function initially the rate is increasing the slope is getting steeper and steeper and steeper until somewhere here in the middle when it turns around and starts to get flatter and flatter and flatter and if we kept going it would eventually asymptote uh, at here's the summary the um, turns out the the best estimate of the of the handling time is 0.21 so um, 0.21 so probably my initial guess of the handling time were probably not that far off but my initial guess, uh, guesses of the attack rate were way off so 1.8 times 10 to the minus 4 um, we get coefficients so here's our best estimate of the coefficient here's the standard error of that coefficient T values comparing this coefficient to zero and P values now these T value T statistics and P values are making some assumptions about the distribution of the residuals as we always have been um, they're they're quite robust to those sorts of things but um, this could be a, a kind of an issue and we get a residual standard error this is the square root of the average variance in the residuals also get a couple of things down here which tell us how long did it take and so it had to try different combinations of the parameters 18 times before it got down to um, a final guess and this number here uh, basically is a measure of what was the estimated slope in the in the likelihood surface uh, at the point where it decided to stop and so it's it's quite a small number remember we're aiming for zero but this is numerical stuff so it basically just says it has to be less than some uh, tolerance value um, which is actually something you can control but only in in sort of you know once you know once you really know what you're doing that's when you start messing with things like that uh, we can get residuals out of these things so if I use broom again I can use function augment and it will give me my residuals my fitted values and my residuals and here's what those look like plotted against each other residuals versus the fitted now remember if we're happy with our nonlinear structure this is going to be a flat line so we're already sort of getting a sense that maybe treating both the non uh, the presence you know with euplodes and without them in the same model might not be a good idea say because we're getting this sort of not quite the right shape here And also there's quite a bit of heteroscedasticity so that's a problem but we'll come back to figuring those sorts of things out in another video